So yeah. now the app is written. Yeah. But now you have the adventure of finding a way to get it performed. How did that come about? Well, interestingly, what happened in my work, you know, this relationship between my work, the, the medicine, and the art stuff, um, is what got me going, thinking that maybe I could really produce it. What happened was I, I've, you know, my, my main professional work has been around depression and its impact on daily life and uh, finding that improving access to care for depression can help overcome disparities in outcomes for underserved minority populations. And I started working here in South Los Angeles with community partners um, through healthy African American families. And the community members that I was working with said, you know, this is such a difficult subject to deal with, not the opera, but depression, that we need to engage the community through the arts. So we did poetry readings, films with dialogue afterwards, and photography exhibits, and so on. And plus, I was very inspired by the community with the resilience that the community partners faced uh, amidst many adversities and the hope, and it was very inspiring to me. So I thought, well, maybe, maybe my, you know, this work about Eleanor Roosevelt has something to say about resilience. Maybe I can build on what I've learned really from the community and offer something. So uh, we made a proposal to have um, as, a, as an outreach activity a symposium about resilience, um, famous women uh, presenters talk about their contributions and their life and their struggles and to present the opera. And this occurred in 2010. I met with a number of people at UCLA in 2008. You know, so the opera was basically done in 2008. And, I mean, there were corrections made all the way through the last performance of the opera. But I started meeting with colleagues at UCLA in the music department. I met with the artistic director of the Broad Stage, uh, Dale Franson. And uh, people told me, stop thinking so much about this opera. Just listen to it. You know, have, have uh, workshops and so forth. So we started workshops. We did one in a friend's home. And... Um, it, I completely revised the work after that. Then we did one at um, the Semmel Institute at the West Auditorium. And um, sort of a funny thing happened at that second workshop in, in that the, the LA Times showed up. That led into a very strange and interesting phase with the actual production. What was strange about it? Well. You know, I mean, you're a doctor, so, right, we spend our lives doing certain things. And even if it's a varied life, you know, research, healthcare system change, seeing patients, all of that, we don't spend our days auditioning singers <laughs> and um, uh, listening to our works performed and rewrite. You know, it's, again, it's stepping into this other persona. Uh, and when the LA Times got involved, they started, you know, they set up a blog, they followed me to my house, they watched me play the piano, they went to lectures with my students, and it was kind of crossing over all of these lives, trying to, you know, they were putting together the story and wanting to tell the story of this friendship and how it drove this 20-year history to an opera. But meanwhile, it meant that they were tracking me through all of these parts of my life that maybe I don't always connect. <laughs> um, plus, it was, it was just a, a wonderful and very strange experience to experience my own music performed, to be at rehearsals changing notes and you know, telling the oboist that it, no, it needed to be a C-sharp rather than a C, and... Uh, going home and spending my evenings revising the work and bringing pages of music back, you know, for people to replace. I was, it was wonderful. Well, the LA Times did a series of articles, right? They, the day of the premiere, they came out with a large feature story, uh, not on the, on, the, on the work itself, but on the, the friendship story and, and about the research and how, I mean, the, uh, the work and how the resilience story also connected 
to what we were dealing with in our friendship around resiliency and making it and recovering and moving on with life and that sort of thing. So what has happened as a consequence of that performance in 2010? What have you done since? What have been the results of performing the opera? Well, for a while, my friend was kind of a celebrity. Have I cried unto thee, o Lord? It was really, you know, his, his beating cancer and, and sort of being the uh, inspiration for, in that respect, for, for writing the opera. So, so he became the celebrity. And you got invited to, I think, Berlin or someplace to speak. And, you know, the opera itself, um, uh, you know, I think, you know, there's been some interest. I, you know, it's not been produced again. I don't know. What I've been told by friends of mine who are in the opera world is it's after your second opera that people get interest in your first opera. Um, and I have completed a second opera. It's going to be a while before it's produced, though. Uh, in any public way, because uh, I mean, what what happened is one of the women speakers, Ellen Sachs, um, wrote a book about her life and her experience with schizophrenia, and she's a very well-known um, lawyer and researcher, and she has survived and overcome you know this terrible illness. So she and I, uh, after after she spoke at my opera, I was driving her home, and she said, hey, this was wonderful, let's collaborate. So we wrote a research grant, which we didn't get funded, and I said, well, let's write an opera about you. <laughs> so we collaborated on the libretto, and I just uh, about two months ago finished the music. But her book has been an option for a major feature film, and um, it looks like it's probably going to be going to happen. And so I am hoping that, you know, to take some small private step of, like with my first opera, of kind of hearing the work myself, and then later on it will hopefully have a production. So of course I'm starting on my third opera instead. <laughs>